Welcome to you all to Laboral uh, Center of Art and Industrial Creation in Gijón, Asturias. And welcome to our program on art, neuroscience, and uh, artificial intelligence when soul butterflies flap their wings. Uh, neurotechnological revolution. It is, t is it time for new human rights? This is the question posed by Mr. Rafael Juste, who is director of the Center of, Art of, of um, uh, Neurotechnology in New York. He studied medicine at the Autonomous University of Madrid. He worked with Brenna in, at Cambridge. He got a PhD in neurology at Kat Sambitze at the University of Rockefeller. And he has been awarded with many awards, uh, including the A. Ellison and Global Leadership by Foundation Talba. He inspired the Brain Initiative of the United States and the International Brain Initiative. And he's involved in the adoption of new human rights, the so-called neuro rights for neurotechnology and artificial intelligence, AI. Good afternoon, Mr. Rafael Yuste. We are really happy to have you here and we're looking forward to your conference. Uh, the conference will last for about 45 minutes. And after that, we will have a round table, as well as Rafael Yuste. We have invited Mr. Gonzalo Solis and uh, Mr. Antonio Bahamon from the uh, Center of Artificial Intelligence of the University of Viedo. And Gonzalo Solis, uh, I didn't say before, he's president of the Committee for Ethics and Research of the Principality of Asturias. Enjoy uh, your afternoon. Thank you, Rafael Yuste. Uh, thank you very much. A warm uh, greetings to everybody from New York. I would have loved to be there in Laboral, in Gijón. I love Gijón. I had crossed fingers to go for to have dinner in Cima de Villa, in the old court. Uh, I also love uh, Oviedo, and I am a hiker. I love uh, going to the mountains. So I had. Uh, I would have loved to to be there and, and, and get my backpack to go to the peaks of Europe or whatever, to the National Park in Asturias. I'm going to tell you today about brain, the brain. Let's see if this works. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if you can see it. Can you see this screen, the first slide? Can you see it? Can you please confirm? Can you see the slide very well? Yes? Yes, otherwise just tell me. Yes, you can see it. Yes, it's perfect, Rafael, thank you. Well, this slide was taken illegally from the roof of our building at the University of Columbia, New York. Those of you who like maps, we are looking southwards. I don't know whether you can see my mouse, my mouse um, moving around. Can you see my mouse moving around? No, no. Well, here there is a white street. It is the famous Broadway. They call it the, the great uh, white street. Uh, to the right, you have a uh, Hudson River. And there at the back, you have the high scrapers. And then here you have the campus of Columbia University, where I work. And to the right, on the other side of Broadway, in one of these houses of flats, there is a yellow light. Lead, and I am talking to you from that window, okay? And as I was mentioning, I am a neurobiologist. I am a physician, but my passion is to know how brain works. And why do I want to know that? Because of the following reasons. Brain is not just any organ of the body. It is the organ of the body that generates the human mind. All the human experience all your perceptions, your thoughts, your imagination, feelings, emotions, behavior, all that is generated in such a way that we still do not know uh, as a result of the shots of uh, neurons uh, and circuits, uh, a thousand million of neurons we have, each of us inside our brain. And out of that mass of neurons shooting each other, shooting each other, uh, comes out all of this. 
if we could understand how brain uh, works, we could understand ourselves inside for the first time. That would be a historical time in our civilization, really. But if that was not enough, there is a clinical uh, medical reason to know how it works, and that is we cannot uh, treat any of the neurological or mental disorders, uh, brain pathology. And I'm sure you all know a lot no, about personal experiences, relatives or friends, Alzheimer, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, uh, depression, mental disorder, uh, uh, cerebrovascular disorders, uh, with a very bad solution. Why? Because physicians to cure, to heal a patient, we need to understand what we call physiopathology. Physiology is the understanding of the function of an organ, a tissue. And physiopathology means to understand when that uh, tissue or organ does not work well and why. The reason why it doesn't work perfectly well. So we do not understand the physiopathology of these mental disorders because we do not understand the normal uh, physiology of brain. So we cannot heal these uh, diseases or disorders until we understand how that system works. So that is a good reason to, to want to know how it works. And the third reason is a financial one. Brain, so that you have a mere idea, has three times more neurons than all the nodes of internet on Earth. Okay, imagine that you have three internet uh, uh, knobs inside your skull. And energetically, it uh, needs as much as uh, a bulb of 20 volts. Eh? So that is what it costs you to maintain the gigantic internet working up there. So obviously, NATA has um, discovered tricks and algorithms that we have here in the brain tissue that may compute in a surprising way anything and at the lowest energy consumption. So if we understood how brain works, the, the, the data industry would, would be revolutionized, sorry. It is like understanding the, the natural energy, so to speak. So if you say, well, if that is so important, why we, don't we still understand how brain works? We understand how organs work, muscles, uh, joints. But what about the brain? Well, for 100 years, neurologists, uh, generation after generation, we have been working on that uh, on the basis of a network trying to decipher these impenetrable forests, uh, according to Cajal, eh? and many researchers have got lost in the middle of those forests. So when after a century you have been, well, um, knocking your head against the wall, you start rethinking what you started to think at the beginning. The central dogma uh, that is uh, in all the science is what we call neural doctrine. It was proposed by Cajal. Cajal called it doctrine. Eh? So it is a 100% uh, true thing. No, I would call it hypothesis. And Cajal and the contemporary uh, colleague Sherton said that the individual neuron is the unit of a structure and function of the nerve system. And according to this theory, if you want to know how the system works, you have to decompose it in singular neurons and study one by one those neurons. And neurobiology has been doing so for more than a century. We have learned many things eh, with many successes. We almost have a catalog of the neurons in different uh, parts of the brain, and we have, well, deciphered them all uh, with a great deal of tail, molecularly speaking, and also cellularly speaking. Physiologists, uh, such as Sherrington, you have been using electrodes uh, for more than 100 years, like this one to the right, to register the electrical unit of a neuron in an animal or a patient and correlate it with the animal behavior 
or with the pathological status of the patient to know what the neuron does. But the problem is the brain has 100,000 million of neurons. And to try to understand the brain, starting neuron by neuron, is like trying to watch a film on a television. And you could only uh, uh, watch it pixel by pixel, imagine. So here you have an image. Some kids uh, jump in on a screen, not television screen. If you want to understand what is happening in this film, you have to understand that there are some things that are these images of the kids that are made up of pixels, or that is interactions rather uh, between pixels, interactions in space, time, and color. And they are precisely, uh, so they are generating these interactions, what we call in science an emerging property. It is the property of a system that by definition is not present in the individual elements of the system. So the brain, if you look into the evolution of the uh, nerve system, brain grows in a surprising way and culminates in the primates eh, of the mammals. And we have a gigantic brain cortex with 100,000 million of neurons. So uh, we have the feeling that nature is trying to manufacture greater and greater television screens uh, with more and more pixels to, to play uh, with uh, emerging properties to generate correlations in time and space with neurons. And the neurons will create the function of the brain. And in this correlation, we have the mental activity of human beings and the behavior of human beings. So if you think in such a way, if you understand uh, the problem scope, the scope of the problem, the experiment we have been doing for some years to register the neural activity one by one is, is endless. No? We'll never understand what happens because first thing you have to do is to see the whole screen of the television to identify the emerging properties. And we cannot do it because we do not have technology. Currently, we do not have a technical way to look at the whole activity of all the neurons of a human brain. And this is the proposal we sent to Obama president in 2011, and he took it as own, and he turned it into the Brain Initiative, US Brain Initiative, as you see there, at a large scale, a long run, 15 years, funded with 6,000 million of dollars, eh? um, involved, involving more than 500 labs uh, from all over the world. And the only aim is to develop technology. Technology to do two things. First, to register the activity of all the neurons of a brain uh, nerve system. It can be a small invertebrate, as for example, a worm, then they will do it in a fly, then in a vertebrate, or like a mouse, and then finish up with the human brain, or if not the human brain, or the neurons of a cortical area, for example, of a patient with schizophrenia and who needs to be looked into. That is to register, to read all the pixels. But if you're thinking, about patients, uh, well, uh, a patient will not care. If we give them all the pixels, we tell them about the problem. If you cannot go inside that brain and fix it, eh? and that is the emergency, eh? the urgency to fix all these mental problems. So the second axis of development of the US Brain Initiative is to develop techniques to manipulate the brain activity and to correct these uh, aspects in the patients with uh, mental disorders. Third objective, to develop mathematical and analysis techniques to decipher all the data that are there, all the thicket, or the mess of, of data, because imagine you have to decipher 100,000 neurons simultaneously. That's a lot of work. So it is now the fifth year of this project. It is going quite well. Techniques are being developed every year. We have started to map the whole activity of very small animals. Uh, two years ago, we mapped uh, uh, the whole activity of uh, 
Nigerias, uh, for example, the corals. Uh, jellyfish, so they all these little animals have already been mapped, okay? And we will continue making headway, but this U.S. brain initiative that, by the way, has continued uh, the same um, uh, under Trump's uh, mandate because it is supported uh, by the two big parties and with the support of the Congress and Senate of USA, it is apolitical, and it has given way to similar projects in other countries. Uh, for example, Japan, China, Australia, Korea, Canada, Israel have launched their own uh, brain projects, okay? Or brain schemes. Uh, each of them has uh, its own its focus, but, uh, well, they want to develop technologies. And the European Union launched another one that is called Brain Project, European Brain jo Project, to uh, gather all these brain data. So it is a great complement between what U.S. is doing and all those other countries to develop countries. And Europe is uh, storing those data. Eh? So they are complementary schemes. So we're in the middle of uh, a race. Eh? in the good sense eh, of cooperation, because all these international projects are uh, under the umbrella of a global initiative of the brain that we launched three years ago from Australia. This is a picture of the Declaration of Canberra with all those signatories of this uh, declaration you know, to join efforts. What will we be able to do with these new technologies? Well, I want to tell you a little bit what we do in our lab. We are researchers. We study the brain cortex of the mouse because the mouse is a good mammal model. And if we understand how it works, at least a part of the brain cortex of a mouse, we'll probably understand how a uh, human brain cortex uh, works, eh? because it is uh, very conservative and uses the same tricks in some species. So we are developing methods that are usually optical, uh, and they do two things. Measure, read, and write. We have the brain of a mouse. We study the visual part of the brain, and with these optical techniques, we measure the activity of all the neurons in a little part of the cortex, and with another laser, we activate or deactivate different neurons. And I'm going to show you an example of the types of experiments that we do. We, you have a mouse on the left, and we trained it so that when he sees vertical bars, he sucks. I don't know if you can see that he's sucking a metal bar where he is receiving some juice. And when the bars are horizontal that come up and down, uh, he should not suck. That's what, what uh, we train it for. So he will suck or not suck depending on the bars. And then we know what he's seeing and what he's thinking. And at the same time, with these optical methods, we record uh, films such as the one on the right, where you have a group of neurons in the primary visual cortex of the mouse that are uh, uh, um, lighting uh, uh, intermittently when he sucks and not. And with those mouses, we carry out the next experiment on the next slide. As I was saying, whereas while the animal is on the microscope, we saw vertical bars, uh, sub neurons. Um, uh, light up and he sucks. If we show it a horizontal bars, other types of neurons, the green ones, uh, light up and he does not suck. And what is good is we turn off the TV, we turn on the laser with which we enable or disable neurons, and using a holographic methodology, we turn on again the uh, neurons number one, the ones now in red that were prior in blue, which were the ones that l l were lighting up when he um, um, got the stimulus to suck. And he sucks. So he behaves exactly the same. And he sucks the same number of times with the same delay 
with the same characteristics compared to when he was seeing that uh, visual uh, stimulus. Uh, in other words, we have introduced in the visual cortex an, a hallucination, an image that he has not seen, but he is behaving as if he had seen it. And that means that with this neurotechnology, we are starting not only to decipher what those neuron is triggering mean, but also we can manipulate them in order to manipulate perception, visual perception of the mouse and its behavior. And this experiment was published uh, last year, and it has been repeated in several laboratories in the US and the UK. And this gives you an idea that with neurotechnology, we can enter for the first time uh, in a very powerful way in the brain. And we can decipher uh, what is happening and change it. So that, of course, what we are doing today with uh, mouses, uh, with mice, will be done tomorrow or even before tomorrow with humans. And that has raised a lot of um, public interest in the consequences, the main social and ethical consequences of those neurotechnologies. I'm showing you two examples of two journals that um, um, are important ones, uh, The Economist and The Scientific American. And they were alerting several years ago that those neurotechnologies will allow us both to decipher mental activity of people, read mental activity, uh, but also at the same time e control it. That's what they were alerting about. What I would like is to uh, update you on what is being done with humans. We work with animals, but I can share with you um, um, information about the work of some colleagues that are working with patients, with humans. This is the example of the, my colleague, Jan Galang from, from, from Berkeley, and he used uses um, um, MRI, uh, functional MRI, uh, scans and they map their mental, their mind, mental activity when they are seeing an image. The same that happened with the mouse. They show an image, not the uh, bars, but perhaps the photograph of a cat. And they map, this is uh, just an example of, of the map of activity of the uh, cerebral cortex of a person that is seeing a certain image. We have two cortical uh, hemispheres and here they are flat. Um, be, in order to see all the pixels or the parts of the cortex, uh, because they normally are convoluted, uh, but we, if we extend it, it would be it would cover two square meters. So we are watching a photograph of those two square meters. The pixels in red are the areas of the cortex that are being activated more when the person is seeing a certain image, and the green ones are less activated. So they map their activity when they are seeing a photograph, and then they show them another photograph, a dog, for example, instead of a cat. And they map the uh, brain activity again. And they show up to 100 photographs. And with 100 photographs, they have 100 different maps of mm, the brain activity. And then they tell the person, think about one of the photographs that we have shown you. And the person thinks about the photograph of the dog. And they scan the brain activity and they say, you are thinking about the dog. And right, they are right. And then they think, they tell them, think about something that we have not shown you. Uh, and then the person thinks that uh, he's uh, on his uh, doorstep uh, at home. And then they scan the brain and they don't, um, they don't, they, they do not know exactly what he's thinking, but they are come very close. You are thinking about uh, uh, a mid-sized building that is painted in jello, and he says, "Right," and they do that with an algorithm that uh, deciphers, uh, that uh, uh, decodes the information and transforms and that into a concept, an idea, which is an image that that person is conjuring up. I'm going to show you how that um, algorithm works in real time. This is the Jackalan work, and you will see on the right a film, a movie with uh, clippings of all the commercial movies. Uh, this is what the person is uh, seeing with his or her own eyes. On, and on the left, you have the words that is what the algorithm is in the, uh, deciphering about the mental activity of the person. The algorithm does not know what he is 
watching, but it is mapping the cortex activity and it is deciphering what it means. For example, uh, you have images here, uh, the sea and a beach with buildings and with palm trees, and this is what the um, algorithm de deciphers, uh, a sky, a building, city, walking, uh, tree. And here you have some actresses and the algorithms uh, decipheres. A uh, woman talking, there's a man, there's a room. Imagine how many things we could uh, decipher without the will uh, or the contribution of the person with uh, these uh, devices. This is a scanner that only exists in hospitals because it is a functional MRI. But precisely one month ago at a conference at a symposium that we organize uh, here in the Columbia Online, a neurotechnological company, Carmen, uh, presented a scanner, a portable uh, scanner of brain activity. This is an example of this prototype. It is not on sale yet, but it seems to work. It is like a helmet, and you can connect it to uh, uh, virtual reality glasses, and it maps, as I have shown you before, the brain activity in a very uh, to a very nice uh, degree. And this is a, a scanner that you can carry around while you are walking on the street. And uh, on the uh, right, on the left uh, right corner, you see a, a volunteer that has uh, that uh, helmet while he is watching that video image. That means that we uh, have an urgent problem with this because on the one hand, we have the devices to scan brain activity in a way that perhaps is still relatively uh, uh, primitive, but uh, uh, with not a lot of definition. Uh, but then we have the algorithms that start, can uh, allow you to start deciphering those patterns of behavior, those patterns of or those images that he that or she is conjuring up. This is an example of the latest uh, developments. It has uh, been presented uh, three weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it is not on sale, as I said, yet. But um, what about techniques? This is to record, just to read. But and then we are considering the possibility that we could perhaps uh, develop techniques to write activity, to change the activity. We are doing that with mice. What can we do with uh, uh, mice? This uh, uh, person is uh, paralyzed, is an hemiplegic, and she has in the uh, motor cortex uh, some electrodes that is connected to a robotic arm. This is an interface, uh, brain-computer interface, a device that connects directly the brain with a computer. Uh, uh, and it can be connected to several other things. And just by thinking, the woman has uh, trained the robotic arm to move according to her thoughts. And you see her uh, drinking by herself for the first time in 20 years. This is a huge milestone for science and for medicine as well. Uh, but at the same time, this is warning us about the consequences that those uh, brain computer interfaces may have. This movie of this woman, it, it comes from a, a study done um, uh, with uh, before the brain project started. So we have, for example, uh, according to what I know, we have the most uh, uh, ad advanced uh, technology now. Instead of having an electrode, she now has uh, one million electrodes. So instead of registering or recording the activity of one neuron, we could record the activity of one million neurons. It has two uh, square centimeters. It is flexible, and you see it on the right. You can fold it, and it can uh, be adapted to the structure of the brain. And on top of that, is wire. it is wireless. So she had cables coming out of her uh, head, but this new interface can be inserted in the brain of a patient. Uh, you close the skull and it is connected uh, uh, wireless. This is uh, uh, conceived for uh, blind people with uh, peripheral blindness, and you can be uh, inserted in this uh, device. It is one year from being approved for use with humans. It is now being 
uh, examined by the um, uh, insti legal institutions, uh, and it can be inserted that uh, interface under the, the brain in the cortex, and it can be then connected to a camera, and with that camera, the person will be able to see uh, with a resolution that is uh, equal to the number of electrodes that that interface mm -hmm. has. And so perhaps uh, um, he or she can see um, an image of the world with one million pixels if he has one million uh, electrodes connected. So, of course, this would be fantastic. It would be a revolution uh, that would deserve the Nobel Prize, uh, according to my opinion, for uh, uh, blind people prosthesis, but it can also, of course, be inserted in a normal person that does not need it, and instead of connecting it to a camera, we can connect it to a database. Uh, imagine a Wall Street analyst that is connected to a database about the uh, um, uh, stock markets in New York, or, or uh, a soldier that is connected to robotic arms with weapons, or we can connect uh, several people uh, among them, or we can introduce algorithms in the human brain, increase the capabilities of the human brain with external algorithms, like, for example, in artificial intelligence. If you consider that that, that is science fiction, I can tell you that Elon Musk, the Tesla founder has created a company that is called Neuralink, whose main purpose or only purpose is to increase cognition of human beings by introducing artificial intelligence with those interfaces, uh, brain, uh, computer. It is not the only company that is working on increasing the sensory and cognitive capabilities of humans. So motivated by those uh, developments, a group of us that uh, made up of 25 people and that I represent, we represent the brain projects of, from all over the world, from all those countries that I mentioned. People like myself that come from the world of research, of developing neurotechnological techniques, engineers, people from the clinical practice, neurosurgeons, people from ethics, from law. And we met in 2017 at this a crystal building that you have on the left that was um, uh, uh, devised by Rafael Moneo, a Spaniard. And this is just, uh, this building is close to another brick building, which is a national monument, which is a physic, physics uh, laboratory. Um, uh, in the basement, they manufactured the first nuclear reactor in history. And physics in the uh, 1930s and 1940s, they created, the, they developed the Manhattan Project that developed the atomic bomb, although it was not created here, but they, it started in Manhattan. That's why the project was called Manhattan Project. But they brought it to uh, New Mexico because of problems with uh, spies, uh, German spies, not because they were concerned about the consequences for the population. But the same physics that developed those weapons were the first to ask for an ethical regulation and social regulation of atomic energy. And thanks to their lobbying activity, to their efforts, they created the International Commission of the Atomic Energy in the 1950s that has controlled the development of nuclear weapons and atomic energy since then. And I hope this cross fingers without any uh, failure. So looking at that building, we met those 25 people to think about the challenges of neurotechnology and of artificial intelligence. We also had people in our group that came from Google and from Silicon Valley companies, and we proposed two things. The first was that this is a topic that, uh, related to human rights, and we propose new human rights. We call them neuro rights. It's, uh, the same that the human rights exist, and you see them on the wall at the Museum of Memory in Santiago de Chile. What we want is to add to that wall five new uh, human rights that are called neuro rights that protect not just the, uh, the body of people, but also the mind of people from potential abuse by the neurotechnology and artificial intelligence. We are speaking about the right to mental privacy, to uh, uh, to prevent that your the content of your mind uh, cannot be deciphered without your consent. The 
the uh, right to uh, m mental, uh, personal identity, what we call the self, uh, because we could take control of the self of the person. You can manipulate people, and what, that's what we want to prevent. And I can tell you my anecdotes if you want, uh, just ask me. And the third uh, would be the uh, right to freedom, to free choice, to the free decision making so that when we make decisions those are not controlled from the outside with neurotechnology or artificial intelligence algorithms the fourth neural right is that the right to equitable access to uh, cognitive augmentation technologies and sensory augmentation and mental uh, augmentation technology so that we do not have uh, humankind at two different speeds, uh, augmented uh, humans and non-augmented uh, humans to apply the, the principle of justice to that development. And the th fifth uh, neuro right is the protection of gender and discrimination that could uh, really be created when you apply that to the human brain. Some of these problems uh, do already exist in technological digital technologies, but we have a problem. If you enter those into the brain, as I showed you with the mouse, uh, you will interpret that as if it was yourself making the, that decision. For example, if you are watching, um, uh, if you're reading a newspaper and you are tr they are trying to brainwash you, you will realize that they are trying to brainwash you. But if it is in your brain, you will interpret that as your own decisions and processes and there we have the duty to guarantee that that line is not crossed so there is no interference external interference with the brain activity of people unless they need to of course in the case of a patient who is uh, ill it is urgent that we use those technologies so the other idea that we put on the table was to use a medical uh, model because uh, changing the you know, declaration of human rights uh, is fine but uh, what for we suggested to copy or adopt the medical model to neurotechnology and uh, artificial intelligence this is a medical model you can think that um, medicine is a technology that was created by by uh, humankind and it can be used for the good for good or for bad but the medicine has been used for more than 2,000 years for the benefit of the uh, um, patient. This comes from the Hippocratic uh, 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 promise, and it has been incorporated into an ethics code of, for all doctors in every uh, country of the world. Uh, and uh, in spite of all the wars and everything, doctors have always acted according to that uh, uh, ethics code. Uh, they uh, have to apply justice, to apply, uh, to help everyone, uh, to help um, everyone equally, and then the principle of dignity, which is to treat patients as, as human beings and not as objects or a commodity. So the idea is to incorporate that model, to open up the umbrella of medicine so that it incorporates neurotechnology and artificial intelligence. Not only uh, um, brain computer interfaces that require neurosurgery that of course will have to, uh, to go through the ethical filter of medicine but also if you do not need uh, surgery that are non-invasive technologies like for example that helmet that I showed you that can be sold as if it was consumer electronics there is no medical regulation to be able to sell it and with this medical model we, um, tr we are trying to uh, incorporate that within the medical regulation as if it was a medicine or a drug that can be used for um, the benefit or for damaging people. So, and I would like to conclude by saying that we are the morning side uh, uh, um, uh, group, uh, that's the campus where we meet at Morningside, and our medical proposal has been welcomed by the Republic of Chile, the Senate of the Republic one month ago presented an amendment to Article 19 of the Chilean Constitution, and they have a draft uh, law about neuroregulation. And this article and this amendment that is supported by both 
uh, wings of the political spectrum in Chile, and both the left wing party, uh, uh, Girardi, this is a Senate by, uh, from Santiago that, uh, that is in charge of the future uh, commission of the Senate, and then Piñera, which is also the right wing politician. They are both backing this uh, project. The whole political spectrum is backing us. And this is a photograph with the, a photograph with the representative of the Catholic University of Chile, which is one of the most famous universities in Latin America. And they count on the support of neurobiologists, uh, social um, support. So it is backed by the whole country. And that law will define that amendment. It will define mental integrity as a human right that cannot be manipulated. And the Neuroprotection Project defines for the first time legally the neurotechnology interfaces, uh, brain computer, neuro rights, defines the data on the brain as an organ of the body and applies to those data the legislation about donation and transplantation. So it pr forbids uh, commerce with those brain data that reflect the human mind, the thoughts of people. And it applies the medical model, uh, not just to the invasive uh, technologies, but also to the non-invasive technologies. And I'm going to tell you something that happened in Spain, that happened precisely in this last week. The Secretary of State of Artificial Intelligence and Digitalization, Karma Artigas, you see a photograph there on the right, has presented the Charter of Digital Rights. Uh, it is now in consultation, and anyone in Spain can submit his or her questions, comments, and remarks um, to this Charter of uh, Human uh, of uh, Digital Rights. This is a very ambitious project that defines a new human rights uh, looking into the future of digital technologies. And that charter incorporates in Section 24 those neural rights such as we propose them uh, at the morning site group. These charters, uh, when it is reviewed after consultation with the citizenship, it will, I guess, sen be sent to Parliament so that the political parties discuss it and that generates a, a legislation that can resemble the Chilean one or not. That's uh, still to be seen. Uh, and I would like to conclude with this. In spite of the serious problems that I think we have with the incorporation of neurotechnology and AI into our lives, we have the obligation to uh, provide a channel to be able to guide the development of those technologies. And I'm quite positive because I think they are going to be very beneficial. We are at the threshold of a new renaissance. If you look at the human renaissance, uh, we understood the uh, role of human beings in the world, and that created a revolution in science, in medicine, in art, uh, literature. We realized that we are not at the center of the universe, that we are just another species. And so now with these new neurotechnologies, we will be able to decipher the secrets of uh, the brain. We will be able to understand what we are, because we are a species that is not defined by our body, but by, by our mind, what we do mentally. Being able to understand ourselves for the first time, uh, I'm sure that it will give rise to a new revolution in arts, in society, perhaps in political systems, in economy, in science, medicine. And I believe that we are uh, uh, in the brink uh, or uh, uh, just round the corner, uh, but we have to do it in a reasonable way, in a sensible way, uh, so that we are not exposed to the potential problems that those technologies might bring up with them. And with that, I conclude. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I will be delighted to answer questions in the panel. Yes, thank you so much, Rafael Justin, for sharing with us those advances, scientific advances and technological advances as well. The most recent events in the field of neuroscience. Here to my left, I have a, a great expert in these topics, Mr. Gonzalo Solis, who is president of the 
Ethics Committee and Research of the Principality of Asturias, a member of the Neuroscience Institute of the Project of Europe of the University of Oviedo. And to my right, I have Mr. Antonio Bahamonde, who is director of the Center of Artificial Intelligence also of the University of Oviedo. And I would love to contrast or uh, compare with you what uh, Rafael Juste has just uh, shared with us, a fascinating information as well as a kind of exciting and concerning, if you wish, regarding the challenges ahead of us uh, right now eh, in this framework of a pandemic. Rafael used, uh, uh, well, called for a transversal connection and joint connection between different fields of sciences and humanities to address such a complex uh, topic, no? Gonzalo Solis, what do you think? Well, firstly, I don't know whether you can hear me well. Yes. Thank you so much to Laboral for having invited me to be here this afternoon with you, this evening. I am here representing the Ethics and Research Committee of the Principality of Asturias and also the Institute of Neuroscience of the Principality of Asturias. I am a neonatologist of pediatrics. I am, well, a bit far from neuropathology, my specialty, but not that far because uh, our uh, premature kids or, or the little kids could also be born with some neuropathological uh, problems. But I'd rather sit here as president of the Ethics and Research yeah. Committee of the Principality of Asturias. Uh, firstly and foremost, thank you very much and to Professor Eusti for your excellent talk, three quarters of an hour uh, with lots of messages conveyed. It has been beautiful. I'd like to be as positive and optimistic as him. Although on the other sofa couch, we also have a professor of uh, artificial intelligence who may think something opposite, no? But as an advocate of the vulnerable, uh, this is of my concern, really. Yeah? I think we need to find a balance between benefits and dangers, if you wish. I know that Professor Yuste, of course, uh, is in that line of action, no? of search. But his talk, since he said, his, his, since he's shared with us, should be of our great concern. At least uh, they are of my concern. There are many potential benefits, but also many potential dangers out there. And it is true that maybe we need some legislation or, or draft some rights. I don't know. We may talk about that. Yeah, that issue of the Hippocratic Ethical Code uh, that uh, guides, uh, has been guiding medicine for many years. Do you think it is feasible that could also guide when addressing or legislating the limits uh, we, we face right now, no? Uh, in the time of uh, technological advances, including artificial intelligence, Antonio Bahamonde. I'm not a physician. I, I only know uh, something about physician from the films or literature, really. I also want to, want to start as well by thanking your invitation to be first line witness of the talk by Dr. Yuste is an honor. Thank you so much. But let me take advantage of this opportunity to introduce some elements in this discussion and to be kind of a, the evil, evil, sorry, advocate, no? They concern me, no? as a human being as well, these aspects uh, shared with, by uh, Yuste with us, his proposal that maybe we have an ethical code. It is of our concern, but things have to be done well, huh? very well indeed. I also think it is reasonable uh, to have um, implemented an initiative uh, here at the level of the state's Secretary, 
I think it was implemented uh, on the 16th of November, this initiative. From the point of view of AI, AI allows me to say goes uh, beyond application to neurotechnology. Neurotechnology is a very important application, undoubtedly, but there are other applications of uh, AI. Uh, regulation should have common um, elements as well as differential elements, because in AI, you make algorithms uh, with a certain aim to solve problems, but it does not really have to do with improving uh, the working or the, the brain working. So what we do, for example, is predictive models uh, or recommendation, okay, for example, you should watch this film or you should buy this subject, for example, uh, for e-commerce. Another great block or section is the recognition of images. Eh? That is what uh, Professor Yusti mentioned, because they are only, the, the brain uh, maps are only like, uh, well, they are just like traditional images, if you wish. And there is another great block of applications that has to do with the management of natural language or the handling of the natural language. Everything has to do with the brain because everything is generated in brain, but they are different applications. And it is important also to say that they are performed by using artificial neuron networks. Okay, so these artificial networks uh, only have in common the words with the uh, physical uh, networks, okay? The artificial, artificial wor uh, uh, networks could be interpreted as a kind of a form that has to be filled out, okay, to solve certain problems. For example, to say if a person is going to like such a soap opera in Netflix, and when you fill it out, you, we call it training. Eh? That is the training of those forms. And in a mechanical way, or a most mechanical way, you can incorporate uh, bits that have already been programmed. But what is most important, or I want to highlight here, is that if we knew more about brain, we would not make better artificial neural networks. Why? Well. Firstly, because of simplicity or conservatism, engineering. If you have something that it works, you're not going to make things complicated, okay? So it is enough. It is sufficient, for example, a radiator to keep up the heat in a room at a certain temperature. So you do not need a chimney. So, and if you knew how brain works, we do not have the software or the hard work necessary to implement a brain. So you do not necessarily have to do in the artificial, artificial world things as you do them in the natural world, okay? Artificial intelligence per se also has some ethical challenges some of them related to what Professor used uh, suggested, but there are many others. For example, facial recognition, whether it is ethical or not, to launch uh, a facial recognition methods down the street in a mass way. Uh, in USA, it is forbidden, but in China, it is being promoted. Another challenge that the set of data feeding these uh, networks should be balanced eh, so that there are no imbalances eh, or systems that classify the white, the Anglo-Saxon, or certain profiles uh, of, of parameters. No? What it is said about AI is that it should be capable of explaining the decisions made in an understandable way, in a way that they can be understood. And here we go into a neurological topic. If the complexity of the brain working has to do with the complexity of the most complex organism in the universe, tell me how 
can it be possible that we are sure what the systems do to read the brain? So that is very complicated. We can never be sure that that reading is accurate and correct. So when we have non-invasive uh, applications that help the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the walls to speak, the, uh, et cetera, so you cannot explain how that is being performed. So those ethical challenges attributed to AI altogether, when you refer to applications uh, to read and to write, uh, referring to a complex uh, mechanism such as the brain, then the problems are huge. And then I have some questions, and I will finish with this. I remember an anecdote um, told by Torrente by Esther on the portico of Santiago Gallery, the master Mateo, who did it uh, many years ago, the anecdote says that he built a time machine, so he came to the 20th century, he observed the glory uh, portico, he thought it was all okay, he realized everybody liked it, so he went back to his age, and that is when he built his portico. So the question is, would it be ethical to use some other mechanism to increase intelligence and give it to the researchers who do these kind of things so that they can advance faster? Is that part of the things that are reasonable to be prohibited or not to be prohibited? And then, if we can, well, give response to all these, are we going to be sure that we are giving a good response? Apart from all the ethical issues, of course. But I think that we have to realize that this is really complex. The example given by Professor Eusti, the Manhattan Project. <laughs> Next to this, it was like a kid's game, no? The bomb is bad when you use it to kill people, and it's good when you use it to generate power, no? Or to uh, light um, um, hospitals. But we're talking about a sophisticated thing that has many limitations and many hindrances as well, and it all depends on the reflection you do. Rafael, I do not know whether you have uh, followed up uh, his questions, comments. Maybe you want to say something in this regard. Yes. I want to, well, just to specify some things. As for how you uh, fit in these ethical issues of neurology with uh, AI, our answer, our reply, is what uh, has been included in the digital rights of the Secretary of State for, it is that these rights are part of a new series of digital rights that also cover the other areas. I agree with Gonzalo. It is only a um, specific competence of artificial intelligence. But in fact, as we are talking about a brain, we uh, and other people, for example, the Senate in Chile, the neural rights may be the spare head of these new civil rights. So it is the example that is calling for new human rights, eh, because we are touching upon the fiber of uh, the meaning of a humor, human uh, uh, rights. So they should be part of human rights. They should protect the humanity of this digital world, because we are entering into this digital world kind of blind. And, well, I do not fully agree with Gonzalo in the fact that neurobiology uh, has a lot to say regarding artificial intelligence. As you know, Gonzalo, the most powerful algorithms uh, use the first learning. And that comes from the studies of the, of the brain. The more we know about brain, 
the more will we be able to improve artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has serious uh, problems to be solved uh, because you cannot generalize uh, part of the problem to the other. And the brain does it without any problem. Eh? Not only a human brain, also brains of small animals. So I think, and with all my respect, of course, that whatever we learn about brain will continue being a source of inspiration for artificial intelligence. And this is not something I am saying. Technological companies are entering into the brain study. In fact, uh, private investment in neurotechnology has surpassed uh, public investment, at least in USA. And who is behind these private uh, investments? Well, Silicon Valley, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and whatnot. They have invested uh, thousands of millions of dollars within the last 24 months. And the very last comment, I agree with you how to regulate all this. It is very complex. The atomic bomb is a kid's game, really. The way we have, and I am representing here is the, the BRAIM uh, project, no? 25 people of ICE, people in the project. The first thing we say is that these decisions are not made by yourself. It's not the researchers who are going to make these decisions. We should not make these decisions. These decisions should be made by open committees, democratic committees, with an important representation of physicians. It should be a medical model. And in these committees, they should uh, say what is included, what is not included. Eh? You cannot all of a sudden say, well, I want uh, a kidney. I pay a million of dollars, and someone will put it inside. No, but it's not a decision. It is a decision made by a committee, an ethical committee, who will say, we have limited resources. Who is going to use the resources? Whoever needs the resources most, right? And uh, from this point of view, well, the people with mental disorders would be the first ones in the list. Uh, but not people who are, well, millionaires, you know, imagine, or, or stock exchange uh, analysts say uh, that should not happen. Eh? Uh, we think the best way to do it is uh, to do it in an open way, democratic way, with some committees or some panel of experts. And decisions are made, and, and they may change throughout the time, because society will also change as time evolves. And uh, what uh, before used to be authorized, and now we think it is horrible. Gonzalo. Gonzalo Solis, you wanted to say something. Professor Juste, um, I'm going to tell you that I'm uh, playing the uh, devil's advocate, uh, so to speak. But uh, two things. Uh, those neuro uh, rights uh, perhaps uh, very similar to the Belmont Declaration. Autonomy, uh, uh, justice, uh, equity in the development or the provision of those uh, uh, developments, autonomy for the person to make their own decisions uh, to, with a free choice, whether they want to take part in that uh, research, um, um, uh, the social welfare, and so on. I've uh, read you a lot. I, I love what you write, and of course, I have nothing to criticize. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, not my um, intention to do so, but it seems to be exactly the same with uh, uh, different words. Uh, more than the declaration, the Hippocratic declaration, the uh, medical doctors use the Belmont one. It's very similar, really. But since the uh, 1978, the Belmont report has set the guidelines in terms of research. And I think that those principles that you are mentioning are very similar, de defined in a different way, updated to some extent in the way you present them. But they always represent those three or four concepts, autonomy of the patient, 
uh, has to do with the free uh, freedom and the free choice, uh, social uh, welfare, uh, lack of evilness and justice and equity. Um, I think they are very similar. And another thing that I wanted to say, and, and again, I'm saying that I, I am no one to criticize or to doubt about your work, but another uh, doubt that I have, uh, perhaps they are not uh, neuro rights, but techno rights. It is not a question of uh, neurology, but about technology. We are talking about reading uh, uh, the people's minds and modifying um, thoughts, uh, people's thoughts. So I think it is uh, too much. Perhaps, I, I, as I said, I'm I'm playing the devil devil's advocate. But anyway, I seems to be I seem to be the only one who sees the negative side. But I'm concerned about that. I'm worried because the private industry has. Uh, exceeded the amount of investment on the part of the public uh, because they see that there's going to be a lot of profit. Of course, if this goes forward, the profit is going to be huge. Uh, and in Silicon Valley or whoever are no NGOs, they are there to invest and to get money, to get profits. And this is a clear uh, witness to that. <coughs> if this continues, neuromarketing, uh, technological development, industrial development, and so on. This is going to provide profits for all of them, uh, uh, um, for sure. Uh, so I uh, still have the same opinion. I'm quite concerned. And what's uh, your opinion, uh, Professor Juste, about that, about what I'm saying, that perhaps this can be the same uh, with different words? Yes. Uh, perhaps I, I, I uh, mistook you. Uh, for Gonzalo. I, I know who is Karen, but I don't know who the others are. So I apologize because I uh, called you the, uh, another name. Uh, I was referring to you when uh, from, uh, it was the other person that I spoke. But those neuro rights are consistent with the Belmont principles, but they are no, not exactly the same. I, perhaps I didn't explain them clearly. Uh, we have mental privacy, uh, personal identity, uh, agency, right to agency, equitable uh, access to technologies and the right to uh, neurotechnology, uh, the right to have a, an, an unbiased neurotechnology. And, and then I was talking about the medical code. That's Belmont, of course, uh, social welfare, dignity and justice. And they are consistent. And of course, you cannot have two codes that are uh, contradictory, but ours are much more to the point. Uh, our neural rights and the way we understand them is an addition to the uh, world, uh, the global declaration of human rights. If you read it, there are some uh, uh, that resemble uh, uh, human dignity, the right to human dignity and so on, but that's the only one. Uh, I don't think it really, uh, there's no overlapping, but of course, we have to be very clear uh, when it comes to articulating them uh, so that people do not make mistakes. But I understand that the Belmont Declaration is the core of the medical model, and that is one of the things that we put on the table, how we can set this uh, going, uh, this type of technology in a, a feasible way instead of reinventing everything from scratch. Uh, uh, but we should perhaps uh, fit in this new piece uh, within the code, medical code. But this would be uh, for the practical purposes for a specific legislation. But if you go to the core, the idea would be those new neuro rights that really define the right to those uh, to the uh, 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 specificities of the human mind that were not covered because when the declaration came out in 1948, nobody had the faintest idea that this was going to be happen, that we could enter the minds of people and change their thoughts. That uh, was not even a subject of science fiction. But uh, I, regard, I don't care about the name, really, neuro rights or techno rights or whatever. In the charter, the Spanish charter, they don't even mention this word, neuro rights. Uh, but the, the, the fact is that they are there. Uh, I don't mind, really. This is just like a, a, a short term that gives you the idea that we are talking about the brain because we uh, define neurotechnology as a technology that accesses and changes uh, brain activity. I don't care really about the name. 
whatever you call it, I, 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 it makes no difference. Sí, sí. Did you want to say something? Yes. Regarding the argument about the fact that technological companies are investing a lot of effort and money in this type of technology, uh, in my opinion, and I agree with Gonzalo, uh, it is just to make money with their application. They invest a lot of money uh, to promote the sports, not because, uh, not for the sake of a sports, but because they can sell lots of devices. And I don't think that it is to improve artificial intelligence. Uh, the artificial intelligence, in order to improve, sim simplifying uh, a lot, it would need two things, to improve a lot in software and also in hardware. And I would like to insist on that. Uh, right now, there are no computers that can simulate the uh, work of the brain. Perhaps there can be an inspiration, but that would not be uh, artificial intelligence. It would be architecture and technology. It would be uh, computers or devices. But this, this can be a, a very technical distinction, but it is important. Hardware or software? We do. We create software, and in the software, we the software that is created right now, you do not need any other hardware and we do not create any other software because we don't have another hardware. So I would like to call your attention to the way in which all this should be regulated. Apart from declarations very uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, with nice intentions and really very open, we have to get to the uh, uh, regulatory level. Uh, there are people like, for example, Elon Musk, that I'm not sure whether he's going to respect all those ethical codes. Uh, and if it's not uh, Elon Musk, it can be someone else. Uh, recently, Elon Musk said that we should regulate artificial intelligence uh, because it made it did things that were almost impossible. And I remember in Casablanca, the uh, Renault, in uh, the chief uh, superintendent, uh, he's playing the game as well. So we have to be perhaps a little bit more demanding. The, we have to get into the regulatory uh, environment. Uh, it's like the uh, traffic uh, regulation. Uh, uh, at the beginning, they just said, uh, 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 you be careful and so on. And now we need regulations, specific regulations. Self-regulation is very nice but it should be much more demanding because self-regulation would be created by the companies themselves that will build the systems and that can be sold so that they can have those applications. And uh, it's like really uh, um, uh, putting uh, uh, something in the hands of the person that really is going to steal, from, uh, steal, uh, steal it from you. Rafael Juste. I would have another question in this context, because when we talk about human rights, there are certain countries and cultures that continue to have uh, many objections and do not respect uh, human rights whatsoever. Uh, on the one hand, we can speak about certain private sectors that really uh, uh, follow other principles and not those uh, that the rest of the population follow. And there are also countries that do not uh, that guide themselves by those human rights. Uh, do the other conversations in this context with those countries and with other uh, stakeholders or interlocutors, what would be your ideas about how we should proceed with those uh, constellations that are more reluctant perhaps to to comply uh, how would you deal uh, with such a topic uh, as complex as neural rights as uh, you say as you said both of you the main problem is in of course in private sectors uh, private sectors that have all the ideas in mind about what should be done with that technology not for the public good. And also uh, countries that have a different idea about the public good, uh, not the Western uh, 
uh, idea. So that's why we are holding uh, ever more intense uh, conversations with private companies and also with representatives of different um, countries. A morning side declaration was signed by the representatives of the Chinese, Japanese, Korean projects, also from Australia, uh, Can Canada, uh, Israel, Europe, and America. So um, all those countries are backing this uh, brain declaration. The uh, people from China and Japan were uh, agreed with us 100%. I think that answering Antonio, or replying to Antonio, uh, well, the two types of measures are missing. One, regulatory ones, so that bad things, if they happen, they have consequences. And also, we have to be proactive. So people who want to use uh, new technologies in an abusive way do not do it. That is why we, we have the, uh, the action line. One, human rights. For example, in Chile, uh, they are starting to protect it legally. And then on the other hand, we have the code that we call technocratic code so that it is used within the private companies so that they have an internal concept of what should be done or not, or what you can do or not. If you're a physician, you have the double axis. On the one hand, because of your training, at the university, you have your own ethical code, and that kind of guides you, you know, in your profession. But on the other hand, when you work in a hospital, as Gonzalo knows very well, there is a lot of regulation that caps uh, up bottom, and they are anchored in, in uh, uh, different uh, health codes in different countries. And those laws or standards make things, make physicians, sorry, to do things in one or another way. So uh, it is a system that is up and bottom, uh, but you should also have a system bottom up. So uh, uh, artificial intelligence is more or less the same. Uh, I think that technological companies, or the ones that we work with, they are interested in everything, uh, and devices, algorithms, software, hardware, whatnot. And there are... Uh, departments in companies focused on a bio-inspired eh, to develop better devices, better methodologies, and they are inspired on, on bio huh? and hardware. Uh, they have the hardware that is based on, on brain circuits. Eh? There is a strong and long tradition, let's say. I would not... Uh, reduce the interest of a field in detriment of the other, eh? or I will not just stick to one aspect of software, eh? for example. And software may surprise you. Eh? Uh, it is unforeseeable to think that that is not going to happen, but always when you say this is not going to happen, that will happen, okay? So I believe that, well, for example, the company that can ignore some of the laws precisely with that company and precisely with the director of what they call the general counsel, the legal um, department of this company, we have had some discussions with them and they are the first ones interested in having a regulatory framework and to have things clear with regard to the ethics eh, and the products they are manufacturing and the same goes for Microsoft, uh, Facebook, IBM, because if you think about it, they uh, show a lot of interest in being perceived as people who are playing cards according to the rules, okay? Because otherwise uh, they will go bankrupt, no? Imagine the problems Facebook had and, and the negative impact, no? Of those problems of Facebook on their stock exchange. So they have some departments uh, within the companies that are the first ones who want to put on the ethical ethical gold medal, yeah? let's say. So up to now, there they have been very, very positive interactions with these companies. So I cannot tell you the name of a company, but we are thinking about organizing one of the symposiums or 
our brain computers uh, with Silicon Valley uh, company. Uh, what happens with these societies, for example, Asia, where they have other social values, so our way is to do it in a smart way. And as I was saying, uh, sit down at a table and define the, the rules, define the, the up, down, and uh, up, bottom, and bottom up, so that we can strengthen a system so that there is no future problems. And I will finish with this. My reply to Carl Ansa, it is true that the world is very complex. Imagine in Somalia, no, <laughs> if you tell them about human rights. But what is true is that the countries that are generating the uh, in leading uh, technologies are some of the countries where uh, either they respect human rights or the reputation of companies will go to hell and also the whole society and economy of the country. So it is not a, a perpetual system, the, the Declaration of Human Rights, but most of the people uh, agree uh, with the digital human rights. Uh, uh, I think there is no other thing that can synthesize the values of humanity as a set of a human being, no values. Thank you very much, Rafael Yusta, for sharing with us your efforts here at this uh, panel and in this uh, day. When we are talking about when soul butterflies flap their wings, it is a very brave uh, proposal, very positive, and I can only say that uh, we applaud your initiative and uh, I wish all the efforts and forces and brains aligned in this attempt to regulate and preserve human rights and near rights as part of those human rights. Thank you very much also to Gonzalo Solis, Antonio Bamonde, for having shared with us uh, this evening in Laboral Center of Art and Industrial Creation in Gijón, Asturias. And just to finish, I will mention that tomorrow at 5 o'clock in the afternoon is Spanish time. We will continue with our program of concerts and another roundtable addressing art and science between the micro and macro. From neural uh, networks of brain, sensitivities of other non-human organisms, and the idea of the exobrain, the extensions, and the consciousness through our symbolic and material devices. Among others, uh, some of them manifested or translated into technological advances as part of our thinking and relating to the world that surrounds us. Thank you very much to you all for your active participation in this interesting event and the roundtable on neural rights. Thank you so much, Rafael Yuste, for having shared some time with us and for your excellent talk. And I hope we see each other tomorrow afternoon and very soon here at uh, Laboral Center of Art to share the work of 17 artists, uh, national and international artists uh, from Australia, Europe, USA, that participate in the exhibition when the soul butterflies flap their wings. Have a nice evening and see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you.